Greetings, everybody. It's Chapo Monday, January 16th. Wishing everyone a happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Hope you are enjoying the day off. But the clock don't stop for us. We're coming at you. Pleased to announce once again, we are joined by a longtime friend of the show, Chapo champion and thoroughbred. It's Brian Quimby, Murder Brian, back in the cut once again. Brian, welcome back. I apologize for knocking my Legos over the second you said my name. <laughs> it's let Lego Masters break out. My God, out. is that Murder Brian's music? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 the, the Lego noise, there's just every podcast I've done for like a year has me fucking around with Legos, which is I fucking swore on my life I would never get into Legos. Like I was <laughs> never going to become a Lego guy because it feels like a Disney guy. What situation uh, were you in where you had to swear that? <laughs> well, I just, you guys know how I am about like, even when I was a kid, I was like, I want to be an adult. Like, I yeah, just want to be yeah, like a 35 yeah. year old man. <laughs> yeah. No, I get it. <laughs> so you make deals with yourself where you're like, oh, you know, I'm never going to be like a Disney guy. And then like all of a sudden, like Disney buys everything. And now there's like even cool Disney guys. And you're like, oh. I don't know, but I'm a Lego guy, so I can't make Legos and pro wrestling. Like I can't make fun of anybody. It, but I do anyway. I, yeah, are, I mean, like worst things. There was um in like uh I'd say like late 2017 through early 2019, you could audibly hear the click and clack of my mechanical keyboard during every episode because I was um I was gaming, and you know what? everyone's everyone's got wait, something. Hold, wait, hold on. Wait, this this <laughs> this is the first time hearing of this. Felix was very distracted and very the shows are very bad, but he led a wonderful life playing video games while he should have been podcasting. Well, you can do both. I don't really <laughs> no, see I, I don't see like yeah, you can. I've done I probably did a hundred and twenty episodes <laughs> while engaged in competitive gameplay and none none were the wiser. Listen, it probably made the show better. <laughs> Honestly, dude, the first it's so funny that you say that because the first season of Shocktober is one of people's favorite things that I ever did. And I can definitely hear you gaming while you're doing it. And I'm like, he's fucking on fire, man. It doesn't matter what he's doing over there. Well, I, I think it will. No, it like helps me because it, it instead of just like sitting around, I'm distracting the frontal lobe of my brain that would usually be worried about like taxes or like you know am i gonna get the heavier credit card that gives me more miles you know am i did i fuck up does uh does delta still are they gonna give me the autism console that i get in business class if i get the <laughs> platinum credit card but it, when i'm when i've got nothing when i've got no equivalent to legos or vaping or emails emails is one of my favorite i'm just you know i don't know what i'm doing you need a meditative meditative activity, or at least high IQ individuals do. When you're a five tool podcaster like Felix, you need like when you're that talented at both gaming and podcasting, you need the two things to kind of cancel each other out. Because if you focus too much on it, you know, you should, it's like you know uh, trying to start a really good car, you know, and then yeah. you keep it in the first gear. I mean, I have been gaming less um, ever since I reached um, Master Guardian Two in CS:GO because I don't. That was farther than I ever thought I would go. So now it's just now it's just all playing with house money. So it's a lot of emails and things like that now as my uh, other activity. I might move on to Rubik's cubes though. Oh, you got to get <laughs> something, dude! I'm telling you, a thing in your hand, a tactile thing. I'm just, I'm, just, I, I, like I said, I didn't want to be a Lego guy. It just like sort of found me. <laughs> Somebody gave me one as a gift, and uh, that's how they get you. I, oh. And then when you go and look how much they cost, you just want to die. Like, like you think how much could something like this cost? And I am currently considering a 3D printer to make my own Lego. <laughs> <laughs> that is, oh my god! That's, I think that's highly illegal. I think that, I think that Lego is going to oh send gosh. a fucking SWAT SWAT team to your house and knock. Just destroy that shit with a mallet if you try. <laughs> that is they are. That, that is like the toy equivalent of making your own like bathtub fentanyl that kills you <laughs> after you can't get heroin. Exactly. I just am trying to make it cheaper. And then I was like Googling, like, how much is a 3D printer? <laughs> <laughs> how much is a 3D printer? <laughs> 
<laughs> I search in because, complete because, sentences. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you good. find that, that a 3D printer, <laughs> if you find that a 3D printer is cheaper than your Lego habit, then yeah, sure, go <laughs> go for it. <laughs> it is. Right. What I'm you, telling you, it is. <laughs> Brian, what do you do with uh, what do you do with the the Legos once they're constructed? Because I mean, you must have tons of them. Like, where do you store? Do you store them? Do you break them down after a while? Do you like uh, categorize the pieces so you can build other things? Like, are they are they all I just tried displayed to, in your house? I try to sell them, and also, yeah, I listen to my wife complain that there's Legos everywhere around the house. Like, why do we have to have a Lego Bowser? in our living room where people come and visit. <laughs> it's funny. Like it's funny for that to be a problem. Like after your kid goes to college. It, yes. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter graduates high school in May. And I'm like, I'm just getting into toys really. So I <laughs> like, she, she wasn't, I don't, I just, I, when she was little, we went and looked at Legos and I noticed that like the cheapest sets were like 80 bucks. And I was like, we're never doing this. We're never, we're never going to get into this hobby. And now it's like, she's never home and I'm the one playing with the toys. It's, uh, it's, it's wild. It's really weird that you guys have met my daughter when she was like five or six and now she's 18. Wow. No. Yeah. Time like I was uh, I was going over the timetable the other day over how long we've all known each other, how long we've been doing this. I have technically known most of you and technically been in the podcast business since undergrad, since like wow. 2013. Yeah, I I I think I started I started podcasting weirdly enough. I started podcasting in like 2006, which was like I don't know. It, it like nobody knew how to do it, and so all of my shows were six hours long because I wanted <laughs> to do Opie and Anthony. It's like, oh, we're gonna have to really do a long show. They they, they do it every day. It must be possible. And then you know, <laughs> we end up learning that like Opie, we end up noticing once we've started podcasting, like Opie and Anthony play like eight of the same bits every day. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like they, they play like a parody song and they get five or six minutes out of that, which I would have liked to have seen come to podcasting the parody song. But, uh, well, I guess Howell does it, how Dottie does it, but like it just, we left out soundboards and, uh, soundboards and parody songs, but I am launching a new thing. So I might get a soundboard now. <laughs> This Lego make one? A, no, that would be sweet if I could got well I do have a Lego Super Nintendo over here <laughs> a Lego NES that I probably could use as some sort of a thing I mean soundboards aren't without precedent uh you know the come town formerly come down uh made strides in the use of soundboards in podcasting technology I mean and I was doing a a, a um call-in show but I'm such a coward that I couldn't do the toilet flushing sound when somebody got annoying or something. Like it would have been great to be able to do that, but it was just like, uh, I can't be mean to these people. I'm sorry. I don't even know how they did it. I remember somebody suggested one time that me and Felix should go to Chicago and say that we want to honor Man Cow and then bring him on stage and goof on him. And I was just like, I don't think either one of us have that killer in us. <laughs> face to face, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> I think I also like, I don't, I just like Man Cow too much. Like, I have no malice in my heart against Man Cow. With Grease Man, like, I think I could execute, <laughs> I think I could execute Grease Man. I think I could be, <laughs> like, if I was a state sanctioned executioner, I think I could do it and, like, I don't know. To go to dinner with my family afterwards i could go play like late i could go play like well not legos so they have like weird new toys i had to get my niece like a 170 dollar magnet uh playing thing uh mm -hmm. i think i could do that with my niece after executing grease man but if i was mean to man cow in person it would be tough for me to live with myself i mean there is something about like the guy like i really like guys that lie um and exactly he is the biggest liar i have i've never heard somebody say something so when he said and i heard it i played the audio that he was the last person to talk to brandon lee before he died 
<laughs> and the brand- <laughs> he was the guy who loaded the fucking gun on set. <laughs> well, though, he was on the phone. Brandon Lee called him and said, I don't know. I don't feel good about this scene. It's like oh his story. <laughs> He's such a good person. Like, uh, just, like, just, like just Brandon Lee, Brandon Lee thought he was like, he had like 30% idea that he was going to die. And he's like, who should the last person I talk to be? <laughs> I know man, cow, man, cow, tell my story to the world. If I pass <laughs> on, he's such a also, fucking good person. I know. Also, Hervé Villachez. He was the last person to talk to Hervé Villachez before he died. He was also <laughs> the last If you're interested person. in not dying, don't call Mancow. Yeah, don't definitely do not. <laughs> He's also the last person to talk to Chris Farley before he died. So, <laughs> pretty sure that was the hooker in the room with him when he died. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild, though, to be a guy that, that like, tells somebody... I, I I did a clip of him recently on Twitter where he was in Monte Carlo and uh Oh sophisticated. I was he wearing like a James Bond tux and everything? Yeah, he was dressed up. He was dressed up and he said he was going in to have lunch with some prince or some royalty and everybody <laughs> replied to me and said that guy's been dead for 20 years like <laughs> he's like uh, yeah i'm about to go on a date with grace kelly <laughs> <laughs> i was the car that uh ran marissa capera Hargaday's mom off the road <laughs> <laughs> but that's what i've always found fun about like those guys or any of the guys really that like I've found is like the the best ones are the liars and the ones that take credit for like it being the first to like to, the the whip them out Wednesday thing is my yeah. favorite one right like there's three people that take credit for that and like it, like Howard Stern said you put a bandana around your uh, antenna and women will show their tits to you Opie and Anthony said put a a um, sticker, the with not on Wednesday the sticker, and Tom Likas said uh, to flash your brights at people in L.A. and women will show your tits, which is like that one doesn't even work. <laughs> no, no, that's how you get. That, no, no, that's how you accidentally get involved in a gang initiation where you're killed for flashing your lights at someone. So, like Tom Likas is actively trying to get people killed with this whip them out Wednesday thing. I just want to, I just want to uh, go back for a second because I think listeners of our show. They, they, you know, probably through, through Shocktober, I think like they, they might, they're probably familiar with Man Cow and Stern and Opie and Anthony, but could you just give just a little background on anyone who's now familiar on the Grease Man? Uh, a guy who, <laughs> a guy who Felix could, lived. he could dump, Felix could dump a gallon of barbiturates into this guy's veins and then take his niece out for ice cream without batting an eye. So just, I would feel nothing. Fill us, <laughs> fill us in on the Grease Man. He's, he's, has said, truly some of the nastiest stuff i've ever heard and and like for people that sort of listen to shocktober and know about it it's like we we listen to people say nasty stuff the whole point of the fucking show is to listen to people say nasty stuff but uh the grease man he talks like a baby you know yeah. like he has like a, a weird baby thing he he has these really strange like uh um what's he has these really strange like parody songs that don't make any sense it's friday the weekend's here and we'll have a kid of me we'll relax hallelujah hallelujah and take off our slags hallelujah hallelujah it's in a rubber house in a rotten underwear but he said some of the most racist things i've ever heard somebody say in my life the dude got fired came back got fired again and it was, it's crazy. He said something about Lauren Hill that is, I, it's just, you don't even want like to repeat unrepeatable. <laughs> unrepeatable. That's, what, yeah, that's, what's, that's what's crazy about Greaseman is like, you listen to his show and like, I would say a good 40% of it is like, yeah, literally baby talk. It's him going like a goo goo gaga, boo doo boo doo boo, a shibbity boo boo when you got your shibbity boo boo, just like stuff you say to a toddler to entertain them. Uh, then the other like 30 to 60 percent is like it's parody songs, but it will be like Mambo number five reworked to be about how you can never get paper clips to work. Right. <laughs> like that type of thing. 
<laughs> and then the remaining content is like Turner Diary shit. The it's most like it's like calling the, just like beyond just like casual racism. This is black tie racism. This is like he's like calling black people like subhuman. Mm -hmm. Like 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 say like the type of stuff that like Varg says. And it he is one of the most astounding puzzles that we have ever worked on. He I calls he calls blowjobs snarlins. Mm. He calls having <laughs> you get some snarlins. He calls <laughs> having the the general prison. <laughs> yeah, he, he calls having sex, having missionary sex, hobble de gee, and then having anal sex, bobble de gee. Hey, I got a hobble story for you. All right, go ahead. Uh, I, I hear you talking all the time about uh, you and Oscar. Uh, you know, double deucing. Yeah. Uh, me and my uh, pappy, we did the same thing. You and your dad do? Yeah. Well, we we double duked the same girl. He was uh, getting a snarl, and I was like, "Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy?" And like, he just has these words where you're like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" And then he's one of the most evil men in the, in the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is like it is kind of like how the Nazis were obsessed with finding Santa. That is kind of the situation we're dealing with with Grease Man. Just a really weird dude, man. Just like a, a real relic of like, I don't know. The, the thing I always come back to is like, like real hard. Like dudes would just listen to this stuff in their car on the way home and and like I think about like a construction worker listening to Howard Stern talk about the Golden Globes for an hour and a half, and I'm just like, <laughs> what is going on? A uh, construction worker on the way home from the job site, uh, just uh, just on the way home from the job site to get some boobly boo from the old uh, the old wifey back at home <laughs> to get some uh, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? That's another one. That's that's doggy style sex. Uh, oh. <laughs> Repulsive. Uh, uh, <laughs> another thing I will note about the Grease Man is that he's uh, he's an outlier on, in the shock jock uh, of the shock, the shock jock species because most of them, whether they're Lycus or uh, Bubba the Love Sponge, they're they're gentlemen of a, a rotund caliber. They're 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 big guys, and and the the images that you shared of Grease Man, he's just. He's very gaunt. It looks like his skin is just stretched over his face, like a foreskin being pulled back or something. He's really handsome. I, I will give him not now. He, I think the evil in his heart has like kind of made him. But when he, his whole thing was like that, like the story. the The biggest story I I heard about the Grease Man was that he was afraid for people to see him. Because he would go on the air and talk about how he lifts weights and, you know, he eats tuna fish to make himself stronger and shit like that. And then people saw him and they actually got mad at him because of how he looked. And I just that takes me so back to like growing up when when. It's a shame that everybody just sees everybody now. I think. Yeah. It does, it does hurt the magic of some of this stuff. Yeah. Except for, but I think Bubba the Love Sponge is like the one person where he looks exactly as you would imagine him or like to imagine him. But Greaseman, Greaseman did get into bodybuilding and he got into bodybuilding. I mean, he did get like decently strong for a 40 year old man, but it just it made him look more like a concentration camp com commandant. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'll say this, like all these guys, like I don't end up liking a lot of these guys, but the one I, I truly love and like I never have gotten into any of these guys shows except for Bubba the Love Sponge. You and love just, him, yeah. I do, I do. I don't he says he's working on <laughs> okay. Uh, I've been told this might be a lie, but he says he's working on a four-part documentary series about himself for Netflix and I think <laughs> that's going to just Oh, uh, that's <laughs> That's content gold right there, Brian. I hope he's not lying about that. They should absolutely let him do that. They did a fucking like 12 hour documentary about some bullshit uh, like uh, 90s ad campaign involving a jet. Do you mm -hmm. remember this? Yeah. Yeah. They've, they will give anything a 10 hour fucking documentary treatment. The guy who let his wife 
uh, get banged by <laughs> Hulk Hogan and inadvertently destroyed Gawker absolutely deserves a fucking documentary about himself. Inadvertently also kind of destroyed Hulk Hogan, although he has he Hulk Hogan has money because of this, but like I don't think any of that racist stuff comes out if that set because he's racist no. in the sex tape. And I just don't think <laughs> any of that racist stuff comes out if they don't have this, which is crazy. Hulk Hogan just had sex and he wants uh, to do, be racist <laughs> immediately. It's sort of yeah. like the George Costanza thing of like eating while you're having sex. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Life's like, two yeah. greatest well, pleasures. Most pleasures are yeah. heightened. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And the story, though, the story about how that tape went missing is, like, I think a great mystery. I, I would say that because Bubba says he didn't sell the tape. He didn't make any money. It did ruin his life. Like, he was living in, he used to have a $12 million mansion, and he was living in a fucking, his car next to his studio for a while after that. He like lost his job he lost his friends and shit like that so he claims he didn't do it and then there is the other side where he's probably lying because <laughs> like why would you tell the truth about that <laughs> well um uh, can we talk about one of my favorite guys I mean, we're talking we're talking guys there's, there's one gentleman in particular that brian i wanted to have you on to discuss and that man is dwight the general man freddie yes, yes. tulsa oh. king that's right. I'm sorry if you've not caught up on Tulsa King, but the season finale is, uh, you know, the, the season one is now concluded. And I really do feel, Brian, I had to get you on to talk Tulsa King because, as I said from the first episode, this is the show. This is the show on TV that's giving me that Kurt Sutter, Sons of Anarchy mm -hmm. feeling. And the finale is, uh, of, of Tulsa King had a couple of the best Sons of Anarchy moments, like on a TV show that I've seen since that show went off the air. So, uh, just just to start out, Brian, like your 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 experience with Tulsa King and, and your relationship with Dwight the General Manfredi, played by Sylvester Stallone. So, first off, like I didn't. Uh, so, somebody asked me this yesterday, right? Like in the two thousands and two thousand ten. There was their butt rock was this type of music that was sort of an amorphous, undefined thing, but it ended up being like just kind of a crappy copy of grunge, like post grunge stuff and Puddle like of mud. Yes, yes, exactly. So it kind of sounds like Nirvana, but it's not. I now so somebody said, is there butt TV? And I was like, you know what? I think everything I like is butt TV because Kurt Sutter, the king of yeah. butt television. Yeah. Because yeah. you think about like these shows are kind of like prestige TV. Like yeah. they have the beats and kind of the, the story. They, generally, like they look well done, like they got good the actors. Pacing. Yeah. <laughs> but they're but. not, they're, they're incredibly <laughs> stupid. Like, yes. Paul said, yeah. King, I watched the first seven episodes in one fucking night. I just, yes, man. I, yes, I made man. my wife that watch it with me. Yeah. Been, I couldn't stop. I have the same thing. I could, I, I, I just, yeah, I, I went in sprees of Dulce King. It's not the type of show I watch one of and I'm like, oh, well, time to do, you know, whatever. No, that's just the rest of my fucking day. And like, I am, I consider myself like a student of prestige and sub prestige. I think I coined the term showtime prestige, which is like a very specific type of premium cable show. You're Ray Donovan's. Yeah, you're Ray Donovan's, your billions, that type of thing where it's yes, like yes. it's like it's like a marriage of an FX show and an HBO show where it just it has like the stupidity and fun of FX, but some of the trappings and even pretensions of a real prestige show. Uh Tulsa King is like is the first of its kind I've seen that's like I don't know what I would call it, maybe like stars prestige, even though it's not on stars. <laughs> It, it's it, it, it feels like it should be on stars. Yeah, oh, it, yeah. It, it, it doesn't even it lacks like the complexity and subtlety of like Homeland, but it is so thrilling and so so eminently watchable, watchable to the point that it will take over your day. It's a new genre of prestige. I don't know what I would call it. Maybe like idiot prestige. It is. <laughs> I mean, that's the shit. I started the mayor of Kingstown too. I couldn't recently. get into that. I, I had a hard time getting it's into too, that. It's too much of a bummer. It's like that last year of Sons of Anarchy where it's like, this isn't fun anymore. <laughs> this guy's just yeah. a mass murderer at this point. 
<laughs> but like uh, uh, with Tulsa King, there is there is a thing in Tulsa King that I think is perfect that I, I that I love, and it is when the dumbest guy in the world is the smartest guy in the room. That's yes. what makes a good yes. TV show. <laughs> it's like it's like acts on on billions. Like he's not a like that character is not written to be a genius, but he wins all the time. Jax Teller is the perfect. Like he's what a dumb guy would think a smart guy is. And I think that is like that's what makes perfect TV. So yeah, I mean, like along those lines, I just have I, I have a few notes on how Tulsa King, uh, the the season one wrapped up. And you'll remember our last episode in Tulsa King. It's like basically tensions are brewing between uh, Dwight Manfredi and his uh, what you know what should be his mafia family back in New York. Um, you've got uh, Dominic Lombon, Lombardazzi, Lombardazzi. And I remember I, I, I made note of the ridiculous wig he was wearing in the first episode. <laughs> well, thank God that paid off because after Dominic Lombardazzi. Uh, kills his father in a bathtub to take over the mafia family as to sort of announce his coming out as a mafia don. He removes the ridiculous wig to reveal what we've all known, that he's just a just a completely bald guy. He's just got no hair. And I got to say, I got to apologize to the Tulsa King. I, I did not trust them enough when yeah. I, we were talking about it the first seven episodes because I said, like, hey, at least when they did this with Corey Stahl in The Strain, they had him get rid of the uh, wig halfway through. Not only did they have this happen with his wig, but it's a character beat because he's got the wig on when he's drowning his dad in the uh, bathtub. But then it's a dramatic reveal when like they're carting the body away and all the well wishes are in the house. And he comes down the stairs and it's revealed that he has removed the wig to show he is now no longer hiding anymore. He is now going to be the mafia Don and he's going to take the family in his clutches and his baldness his true self is being revealed in that moment. Whereas opposed with Corey Stahl in the strain, they were just like, okay, nobody's buying this. Let's just say that he wants to, uh, he, he wants to, he wants to evade capture uh, because he's on the run, whatever. Just get that fucking wig off his head. Well, something I loved about Tulsa King is that it is about a 75 year old man that <laughs> yes. every time he punches somebody, he nearly kills them. Like, you, you yeah, he this is, to me, it's he like, he's a physical Force. He is the strongest, <laughs> fastest man in the entire state, in the entire region. He is like, I, I, I don't think there's anyone who can physically stand up to, yes, this man who was born presumably right after World War II. <laughs> Brian, you described to me it's like a 75 year old man with the physique and uh, the physique and uh, physical power of Jack Reacher. This is, yes, this is yes. J J Jack Reacher as a senior citizen, but uh, but you know he's got class. So uh, like uh, uh, Dwight's, uh, you know, former mafia family, the old Don dies or is murdered by his son. The bald son takes over, and the first order of business: we gotta whack this freaking guy, Dwight. I'm tired of his disrespect. This fucking this Mama Lukey's, and they're like, oh, he's a made guy, and he go like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm boss of this family now. <laughs> and then meanwhile, back in Tulsa. Dwight puts together his own family, um, including the, uh, <laughs> the the former employees of the uh, marijuana store he's now extorting. He just shanghais into being in his new mafia family, and they're like, they're like, um, are are we going to be killed by the mafia or a biker gang? And he's like, not if we stick together and be a family. You gotta yeah, be no, a family. He, he does he does the kidnapping version of employment. <laughs> and it's just like like Dwight Manfredi's criteria for like who should be in the mafia is just like, have I met them? Are they the first person <laughs> I've met? Like literally, literally his his like um, combination Capo regime consigliere and underboss is the first guy he met which is his uber driver <laughs> that's like driver, that's yeah. enough for him did i meet you okay you have you have all the responsibilities in the world <laughs> i i i matt pointed out to me because i'm not good at this stuff that one of his partners is vinnie del pino from uh yes doogie from hauser <laughs> yeah i was like i recognize that guy but that's another guy like i think one of my favorite parts of the show is that guy like really does try to kill Dwight Manfredi yeah. and then within one episode he's like hey let's work together you know it's going to be really fun like 
he forgives the guy for shooting at his head while he yeah. was learning to drive. By the way. <laughs> and not only that, not only does he forgive uh, like uh, the guy who tries to kill him during the driving test, he does so much more than that. He gives him his self-respect back because, you know, he's been hiding out and he's like, you know, you can't hide for too long. Sometimes you got to stand up. And the guy's like, thanks, guy. I was trying to kill an episode ago. You really uh, you've given me my life back. Oh, by the way, my wife has left me. But you know what? That's a good thing because I can be a re- I can be my own man now. Well, that, that is a me- that is a metaphor for his namesake. Um, the, the, uh, the, the real Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower for operation paperclip. He does his own <laughs> operation paperclip with all the guys that were previously trying to kill him. Uh, another thing I like, there's, there's another, like, so the, like his mafia family sends, sends a guy from Brooklyn out to Tulsa. And then what happens? Dwight just recruits him. He's like, you, uh, you want to join my family? And he's like, yeah, okay. These guys suck. All right. I'm with you now. I That's know all it takes. <laughs> it makes it seem like Tulsa really has has it going on because like everybody that comes to Tulsa in this show is like, you know what? I love Tulsa. It's great. It is. <laughs> I've been to Tulsa before. <laughs> and, yes, including the guy that uh, Dominic Lombardano sends yeah. by train because he hates airplanes to Tulsa to like see what's going on with Dwight. When he's then met by uh, the crew, the whole mob family sh- to show up and just have like a stand and glare yeah. uh, confrontation, uh, Dwight's like, "Hey, you want to join us?" And he just uh, he just walks yep. over and he's like, "I'm with you guys now. <laughs> okay. forget, forget Brooklyn. <laughs> Tulsa's for me now." Matt, I love that scene. Cause you, like, your uh, your vision your vision of, of running a, a fucking. Uh, <laughs> Your vision of running a casino in the back of a honky tonk on a uh, Indian reservation it has me inspired to leave New York City and its promise. Uh, that scene was incredible because, like, the whole season is building up. It's like uh, these guys from New York they, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna whack Dwight, you know, and they and they they go out to Tulsa under the guise of some uh, armistice, or, 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 you know, to to make peace, to break bread with Dwight, but they're only going there to kill him. And you think that this is gonna like come to a head, and maybe they're gonna like take a you know, try to try to kill him or something like that. But like essentially Dwight just shows up to their hotel and like meets them on the rooftop pool. Like just sort of like you said, Matt stands and stares at them with his crew. And then he's like, if you ever come to my fucking city again, I'm going to fucking kill you. And then they're like, all right, bye. No, but even better than that, (laughs) even better than that. He like, they're like, they're like, Oh, how many you guys you got in your crew? And then Dwight's like, see those guys over there? See those guys over there? They're with me now. And the guys that he hires to be his like his muscle and his crew are literally two sets of cowboys and Indians. So he's got both yes. cowboys and Indians being like shooters for him. And like that's it. We never see Dominic Lombardzardo uh, and his bald dome again. They just go back to New York. I mean, assumingly, you know, season two of Tulsa King, I'm sure they're gonna keep this going. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it, it'll keep going. The war will keep going, but Dwight can only expand Tulsa his, and New York. Yeah. <laughs> he, he he can only expand his gang, and the gang includes. Okay, we already went over Uber driver guy who tried to kill him. There's like a self harming emo girl. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, was weird. That's, that's one of his one. soldiers. Who's who happens yes, to be a, a crack blue shot? Hair, yeah. they them who worked at the vape shop. Who was un- also was taught to uh, was taught firearms by her suicidal father, <laughs> and uses them to commit just cold blooded murder. Yeah, she shoots and a guy right ahead. Like the first episode, she was like, uh, "You guys are triggering me right now." <laughs> yeah, she yeah she is the first they fab to kill a made man in the mafia. <laughs> I, I would also say that I I think the scene that really I bought into and my wife bought into is is when they're smoking weed in the uh, truck yeah. and he's just talking about pronouns. <laughs> but you think he's going to say something like mean about pronouns, but instead he's just like, oh, you know, you just got to be who you're going to be. You know, I'm too old to figure this stuff out, but you got to be who you're going to be. And I was like, okay, that was like a little more mature than I expected from this <laughs> it, show. It was surprisingly reasonable. I feel like there was like after the midterms, there was an emergency rewrite where they're like, okay, like normal people have rejected culture war. We have to make Dwight Man Freddy uh, anti-libs of TikTok. Maybe that's, maybe that's someone he goes after in season two. 
someone who's trying to extort the local school by uh, putting their teachers on libs of TikTok. And Dwight Manfredi <laughs> has to beat up a hideous Habad woman. <laughs> I was I I really hated that the that the uh, ATF agent that he charmed turned on him like that. I that to me, cold blooded. Yeah, that's too much for me. I I can't. I don't want him to spend a lot of. I hopefully he's out of jail right away. Yeah, in the I mean, uh, uh, new season because I don't. I, I mean, when he was in jail, he did read a lot of good books. <laughs> no, season, no, I mean, like he, shows like this, like the judicial system. All you have to do to get out of like a 30 year prison sentence or a 30 to life prison sentence where you are like on tape committing several murders and racketeering is like send a letter to three judges. You have to like do a favor for a few for a guy who's also in jail and he will somehow get you out of your your gas price sentence. I really I'm not too worried about Dwight going back to prison. That's just not I'm, what happens in these shows. I'm not worried because season two is going to open with another 20 year jump into the future. And he's coming up at his <laughs> his next 20 year jail sentence. And he's now he's now 130 years old. And there are like flying cars. And he's like, what the, what the hell? I just used to be on the ground. I can't take this shit. Yeah. And his well, new mafia is like the maid from the Jetsons. <laughs> George Jetson. Um, it's funny that he. It, it's funny because like he. I, I'm guessing that he seduces the ATF woman again, and she gets him out. Yeah, is, is what my guess is because he has also like. That's the other thing about him is like he's just everybody. All the women want to fuck him. He's 75. <laughs> But yep. uh, he he does. Danny, that, Del Dana Dana Delaney Delaney's out there in her cowboy hat, just like yes, please. Danny Delaney, by the way, still looking great. Yeah, um, not looking bad. Still absolutely. looks great. I um, think I think it's I think it's going to be more of an emotional play because he already like he's already shown his sexual prowess. But it's going to be something like, um, hey, look, I know you got a job to do, but I've just spent you know twenty. I've spent you know third of my life in this thing. I'm just meeting my daughter for the first time. When are you gonna let a guy like me get to meet the people meet meet the people most important to him? Let me be around my family, and that'll like touch her heart in some way. Or if they go really stupid, he'll represent his himself in court and win. Oh, yes, yes. I I mean it, it is wild because we keep hearing these reading these stories about like people from like California and New York like moving to these towns and like driving the uh, uh, rent up. And now Dwight Man Freddy's doing that just simply by himself in Tulsa with all the people that are like the, his daughter moved there, her kid. Uh, I don't know if her husband was there yet. She might have. I did not see him. I don't know. Did she leave his ass? Yeah. I wonder. If, because he was like, I'm not leaving New York. He's the most reasonable guy in the show. <laughs> He's the most white negative guy in the show, too. More so than the people who are trying to kill him. The people who yes. are trying to kill him are like, we have to kill him because he is like he is Dwight Eisenhower. Like he is a general. He's a commander. <laughs> He's a threat to him. And the husband is the only guy who's like, this is a 75 year old murderer. <laughs> like why are we like reorienting our life around him? Yeah. Like he's and also, else is like no, he's cool. Yeah. Also, the, the in the last episode, it, it it flashes back in time to show you the crime that Dwight went to jail for, which is spectacularly yes. stupid. It's basically some some mook is getting shaken down by like the bad mafia guys by by the the bald guy and the dude who played Lucky Luciano on Boardwalk Empire. The guy was like, "This Dwight's got no freaking respect." So they're like beating the shit out of some guy that they've like handcuffed to a radiator, and they like burn his face with like a spatula or something. And then like he's like, "I want to go. I don't have the money. Please just call Dwight." And then like uh um the like his other guy, the guy who fled to Tulsa, is like calls Dwight. And he's like, "Dwight, you gotta come." They're, they're burning this guy's face. So, like, they come to this, like, the fucking abandoned building in Brooklyn. And then, like, you realize that Dwight wasn't trying to kill this guy. But, like, the other two idiots just knock over, like, I don't know, an oil burning lamp or something. <laughs> <laughs> they dropped, they dropped, they, they, they made a potato masher into a brand. Yeah. And then they dropped it on some rags on some and it caused the rags. fire to explode. And then, so, like, uh, so, then, so then, like, they're like, oh, shoot, we better get out of here. And then, like, the guy who's handcuffed to the radiator is like, Dwight. 
Dwight, you gotta help me. And then he tries to shoot the handcuff, and he's like, oh, and it shit. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. He's like, yeah. oh. he says, like, freaking premium steel. <laughs> he's like, oh, shit. And the guy's like, Dwight, Dwight, you gotta help me. And then Dwight's like, uh, I'm all right. I'm gonna, gotta help you. I'm sorry. And then he just shoots him in the head because he's like, I'm not gonna let you burn up. I'm not gonna let you burn. And then he, like, walks out, walks out of the building, and there's, like, cops already there. So, like, he basically. Like and earlier in the show, he said, "Yeah, I killed the guy. I think kind of in a way, I did him a favor." And it's like, yeah, you know, in a way, it was an act of compassion. You know, he chose to he chose to shoot a guy in the head rather than watch him burn to death. So we realize what assholes the uh, the whole New York mafia has been. And as as I just just mentioned, like the uh, there, there really is no climax between him and the New York family, other than <laughs> a tense meeting at a rooftop pool that ends yes. in basically just two people walking away, and that's it. However, however, I do need to talk about the the Rebel Outlaw Motorcycle Club, Black, Black Adam. Black oh Adam. My God. Black Adam. Now, Brian, I need to talk about this because I, I mean, I feel like my podcasting career really began with the observation that streets, the Sons of Anarchy are killing roughly roughly two dozen people a year for like an annual income of probably thirty thousand dollars, like the crimes that they <laughs> yes. did. So, like, I, Taylor Sheridan and Terrence Winter have created in Black McAdam an outlaw motorcycle club that is even dumber than the Sons of Anarchy, right? But actually profitable. <laughs> yeah. They actually put, put some stacks together. So, well, they, well, this they don't is, even well, this explain is the irony. what they do. Well, no, 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 there's no, no. no explanation they, they for just, how they okay, have that like, money. The, the main Black Adam guy, like the, the scary Irish guy, has like a flash drive with like eight, $8 million in cryptocurrency on it. Or it's, a, it's in some like bank in the Bahamas. And then the Martin Starr character just hacks him and takes away all his money. Yeah, just takes it. He sent him a phishing email. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so conflicted, by the way, by Martin Starr being in this because I love Martin Starr. I, I, I've loved him in all his iterations. One of my favorite TV actors. Uh, a guy who should be in more things. And obviously, incredibly happy to see him on screen in anything. But seeing him in this is, like, a little depressing for me. It is, like, like to me, like, to me Martin Starr should be, like, up for an Academy Award for some, like, bullshit, you know, A24 movie about, um, I, I don't know, a, a diet that kills people. I don't know, some elevated <laughs> horror bullshit. But instead, he's in Tulsa King. And as much as I love seeing him in this, I do want more prestige or prestige for Mr. Star. Yeah, it, it, it. the thing is, though, this is, I think, TV now. I do think that the prestige TV thing is is very dead. Like, yeah. I, I, yeah. I can't think of anything that I've watched recently that had those i'm better call saul i think maybe better call saul is the thing that's that gonna ends. be the last the, one the, i think that's the last of the genre the only two and even yeah. that was a fucking spin-off and yep. like the new the, the 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 new uh cadillac uh uh hbo series that just debuted is a fucking adaptation <laughs> of a video game yeah <laughs> zombie thing too it's a fucking, over yeah yeah, yeah. zombies the only Ugh. like the only two like going concerns that i could have seen as prestige in any other era also HBO, are White Lotus and Succession. Those are the only two conventional things yeah. holding that mm. flag. Uh, as, as far as, like, you know, Sopranos, Deadwood, Rome, there's really nothing nothing else like that. I think, um, I think we are heading for a more unpretentious time, perhaps. Taylor Sheridan is just going to make doing it. Oh, my I God. He's going to make he's doing everything. It. Dude, like, he's going to do I, it. He's gonna, he's gonna, there, eventually there will be a TV series covering every year up until the year, like 2022. So it'll be Yellowstone 1984, a Yellowstone origin story. And it'll just cover all the Yellowstone ranch and like every, and every, every era of American history will be fully saturation Taylor Sheridan coverage here. The battle space has been prepared. Yeah. And the, but, you know what? The next prestige thing, the actual next prestige thing after White Lotus in succession that'll be made in 15 years from the culture recycles uh, that I think we can pitch and we can run. It will be a prestige show about the interpersonal war between Kurt Sutter and Taylor Sheridan. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you guys, cause like I, I tried to watch Yellowstone. I couldn't get into it. Not for me. The first not episode for me. is 90 it. minutes. You don't do that. I, I went with 
open range, which I think was actually very fun and cool. I don't know if you guys watched that yet. I don't know how Amazon pilled you are because like, I think it's, it's horrible. There's like nothing, nothing great on it. Well, the boys is okay. Pe- people, people have told I really me like that the boys. Yellowstone gets, uh, I like the boys a lot too, but people told me Yellowstone gets like really good and crazy and over the top if you stick with it. But like the first couple episodes that I watched of it just felt like sort of like the right wing version of the West wing. You know, we're like, yeah, yeah. Characters yeah. Will just say like uh, like libertarian uh, canards, but in a cool way. And uh, and Kevin Costner just is so ridiculous. Like it's just whereas Sly yeah. Sly is like good ridiculous. And Kevin Costner doesn't know how stupid and insane exactly. his performance is. Yeah, exactly. Well, y- Yellowstone. Kevin Yellowstone. Costner, he's just talking like he, Kevin Costner just doing a bad Clint Eastwood impression. And it doesn't. Yeah. Suit him. Whereas Yellowstone. Sly is just being Sly. He's white. He's the general. Yellowstone is like, it's a show for like Trump 2016 to Biden 2020 voters. Mm. That's like it's, the type of person who watches that show. That's why it's so successful. It is for the most median of median Americans. It is the biggest, it is one of the biggest shows on TV for sure. And you hear that all the time about how like this show is just a juggernaut with like these massive ratings. But it's like, I don't know if I, I, I liked like the things I've liked recently are our Reacher and, Reacher uh, um, oh God, there's Reacher no better was so show. Much fun. It, it was the most perfect show. And like uh, I really liked that and open range and uh, um, shit uh, like a lot of the stuff I like is like comedy stuff, which was like unheard of years ago. Yeah, because like everything's a dramedy now, you know, and and leaning heavily on the drama part of it. It is very hard to find somebody doing actual real comedy uh well, south side is a show that i south, love south side is very good i recently recently uh have have uh been uh been made aware of it it's very good uh goliath i really like goliath uh the billy bob show the billy bob show goliath is terrific i think i, what about, I watched the first season of that seen, i thought it was good i liked it has anybody seen sneaky pete I which have is not watched that no one. i've not seen it i watched i think i watched the first uh season of that and i was like that's fine, but that's as much as I need. I don't need well, any more. Well, there's as long so as many talk- of these things that there's so many of these things that have come out recently that had like nine seasons. Like Animal Kingdom is a show that I truly don't. That me and Will should watch it. We sh- <laughs> we should be watching Animal Kingdom. But I just am convinced that like fifty thousand people watched Animal Kingdom. <laughs> I would say the uh, for me. My my favorite show currently in the TV multiverse, uh, Beyond Demon Tulsa King. It is a, a very soy choice, but I, I would have to say I like the boys the most. I feel like it has the most uh, uh, jejun that um, Banshee had, not just because of uh, Anthony Starr. It has a very 2006-ism to it. I, I, I truly, truly love that show in a way that um, nothing else is really, really doing it for me in that same way. I still watch Billions. I think um, I really like Corey Stahl. He's just not the same. He's as, not Bobby uh, Axe. He's not Bobby Axe. I mean, like Damian Lewis, I don't think he would like to hear this. I don't think he likes this about himself, but he was born to lead Showtime shows. <laughs> and they just can't. <laughs> they need him. And Jim Motti is doing a hell of a fucking job carrying that yeah, thing but, without Bobby Axe, but it's just not the goddamn same. And I just it's uh, not the, the boys, same once they stop my... making uh, Jim uh, uh weird sex, uh, <laughs> weird sexual fetishes a big part of the show. I need they've, they've come back. They've come back. Oh, they've come back. All right. Okay. Good. Yes. Good. Thank God for that. Uh, I, I just really quick. So we're talking about. Um, comedy in the guise of drama and vice versa i gotta talk about like two of the funniest moments on television that were i've like that i've seen in years that were contained in the tulsa king season one finale all right so i was talking about uh uh dwight and his new york family that like th- that that battle has been deferred to season two but yes. the showdown between him and <laughs> America's worst <laughs> biker so game, Black McAdam. <laughs> Black it's McAdam w- w- exploded in, in, in the season finale. So, like, the leader of Black McAdam 
is like this just an Irish guy. I don't know. I don't know how he ended up in Tulsa because it's somebody like he's mad at Dwight because he's like, you come here to my land and start taking money out of my pocket. <laughs> And it's just like, dude, what the fuck? You got off a boat at Ellis Island like two days ago. What the fuck are you talking? How did you end up in Tulsa? So well, what uh, they, like, the, so Dwight what? and his crew, like, they, they 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 empty out this guy's bank account. So he's going like, and he's he's got all his guys, he's got all his guys like lined up outside a barn, and he's like, "What are you gentlemen gonna do about it?" And then just one guy, <laughs> one guy is just like, "Ah oh, man, I don't know. I think maybe like the ATF and FBI are like really looking hard at us right now. I think maybe we should like lay low for a minute." And the dude just takes out a gun and shoots him in the head, just straight up. Just just shoots him what? dead in the face just for being like, hey, um, can we just like maybe like uh, just circle back to this maybe? So he just executes this guy and he's maybe like, maybe we don't need. We have apparently we have eight billion dollars in a, in a bank account somewhere. Maybe we don't need the the lucre from our uh, nitrous <laughs> balloon sales. Maybe we just let them have that and then not antagonize the multiple federal agencies that are on our shit. We just got raided by the ATF a day ago. So this is like what. Our, so, so like, okay, this, it all comes at like, so like, uh, Dwight and his crew, they, they're holed up in, in Dwight's place of business, the bread to buck bar. Okay. So like, they're like, he's like, he's planning out his, they're like, like operation overlord, which for Dwight, the general man Freedy is like, you get your guys and you just sit around a pool table waiting for the bikers to attack <laughs> you. So the head, the, the head of black Adam, the blackest Adam of them all. He's like, all right, lads, you know what the fuck to do. Here's what they're going to do. We all know they're in this bar. He's like, so here's the plan. We're going to walk single file through the door <laughs> one at a time. <laughs> yeah. so like, yes. so like, he, gets, he gets all his, all the gang. They they go through one door. They're not like, he's not like, you two go around the back. You know, and they, they're no. Like, no, no. All of them run through the same door at the same time, like the fucking three stooges. And then like, <laughs> they're just in a fucking, <laughs> it's just a bottleneck. And then Dwight and his crew pop out from behind the bar and just it's like a turkey shoot. They just shoot yeah. all of them in a row. He sh he fires one bullet. It goes through three guys. And is <laughs> Yeah, no, the the, the, the self-harm girl, she sent uh, just so many guys to hell that day. Yes. Um, I, um, I, 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 I want to read a little more into this scene and the presence of the biker gang because I don't know if I've told you guys, I have heard that there is smoke, there is a rivalry, there is hatred between Taylor Sheridan and a Mr. Kurt Sutter. What? Do you think <sighs> that this scene was Taylor Sheridan sending a very strong subliminal? Holy to Kurt shit! Then yes. like, yes, I do. Not, yes, yeah. I do. And it's like this is Here's your, your guys. Sons this is yeah, your Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> this is what would happen if they went up against the fucking Tulsa King. This is yes. what would happen. Yes. This is you. Also, I'm Tulsa King. You're your Irish bullshit dumbass. Well, I think also, that's what it I is. was I was just gonna ask, like, what is with these guys and and the, the Irish thing? Like it's widely considered that Sons of Anarchy got bad when they decided yeah. to go over to <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like why what is like irish guys are the toughest guys in the world but when you're in a show about italians <laughs> they're always gonna win like yeah italians yes. are tougher than irish <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the irish Southwesties. have never won in an american movie against the italians no or puerto ricans or black people or anything the irish here's the thing the irish mafia exists and they're called the police the of any major northeastern city yeah the, the yes. irish mob as an actual criminal gang the only time it has ever been portrayed as more than three people is the movie <laughs> The Departed. <laughs> and we've seen yeah, like every Irish guy who's like tough psycho with any kind of ambition just becomes a cop. Everybody who's like doing it's like sitting around in a bar type crimes is a dude who like couldn't pass a civil service exam. Exactly. <laughs> the Irish mafia being in the Irish mafia, it is like the national guard. If the mafia is the real military, <laughs> it's just nothing. Like if you're an actual, if you are of Irish descent and you have any criminal talent, you're just loaning out to any other ethnic gang. Being in the Irish mob is just, it's giving up. You're the weekend <laughs> warrior of organized crime. I mean, if, I if, know. If soda bread. Yeah. No, <laughs> if, if dude, if someone, if three guys, and I think that for all of Los Angeles, there are probably three guys who would openly say they're in the Irish mob. 
If the entire Irish mob showed up at my doorstep to try to extort me, I would laugh them out of my building. <laughs> I, what is, I, what? I'm not afraid of them at all. The least feared criminal I, gang. I, so I don't know what Sutter's deal is with it, but I, I think that I think that that Will's theory is correct. It, like this is them. This is uh, Sheridan stunting on Kurt Sutter and being like, "Your Irish bike dickheads." Uh, in, uh, against against my Kulsa Kings, they get instantly <laughs> yes. uh, annihilated. Yes. And, <laughs> oh, by the way, because like they even try to build up the Irish guy as like a, a real mastermind, yes. <laughs> like a, like a classic evil like a uh, 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 puppeteer who's gonna have like a long term plan. And at the end, nine episodes it takes him to just walk into a building and get his <laughs> get head shot in the head on a <laughs> fucking uh, uh, on well, like horns. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, 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 uh, okay. A li- reading a little more into this analogy, into this metaphor, who was the leader of the Suns after Jax's Jesus Christ death moment? Chibs. I don't. The Ir- Chibs. Oh, yeah. Chibs. 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 Yeah, yeah. Chibs. The Scottish yeah. Irish kind the of a weird guy, yeah. mix of the two a scottish guy who's really into ireland his uh wife and daughter were stolen by a member of the ira it's very confusing but he represents the sons that is chibs and chibs gets gibbed and that is it <laughs> that is the metaphor taylor dude, sheridan kinda looks like chibs the guy with the ball like dude <laughs> yeah uh, yeah taylor well, sheridan i think is look like i said Yellowstone, it's not my type of thing. I um, it, it, clearly it's not for me. But Taylor Sheridan, if he's shown anything, he's got something for everybody. He's and stunting I, up Kurt Sutter right now. He's stunting the <laughs> oh, yeah. fuck up. Just, oh, <laughs> well, just dancing Kurt on Sutter's his, doing dancing on his grave. Kurt Sutter got canned off his own show. Yeah, yeah, and he's Meanwhile, doing a Taylor another- Sheridan is the, is behind. T- two thirds of scripted television. Kurt, I kneel. I kneel to Taylor Sheridan. Tell Sheridan, I bend the knee to you. If you need anything, if there's anything outside of your incredible realm of expertise, if there happens to be something that you need my assistance on, I will make that show for you. All right. <laughs> let, me, let me let me bring it let me bring it full circle though, because there's there's one more there's one more thing that happened in the Tulsa King finale at the very end that I was dying. I was rolling. This is a full circle moment because this encompasses everything. The four. The, this encompasses all four. The, all four of us are all of our interests in television. So, I, I mentioned that that the the bread to buck saloon, Dwight sort of adopts it as his base of operations and becomes business partners with like the former, uh, you know, rodeo like Bronco rider guy played by Brian uh, he- Headland or whatever. He goes business partner and then like so his plan is like all mafia guys. To open a nice classy joint, got some good food, got some good music, little gambling in the back, you know, to run a casino, right? Because that's like a license to print money, and like they, they get like an, you know, like a, like a, they they get um the, the Native American guy who grows all their weed to like sign the papers so that they can open a legalized gambling like nightclub, and they need to rent it, but they need to renovate this rather seedy cowboy bar. So like the like af- after the, after the massacre there, which is like it's funny that like they, 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 that just happened and there was no investigate. Like fifteen no. guys were murdered. Ten guys got <laughs> shot and killed. Bar, and then like it's nothing. notable guy. They just buried him behind the bar. It, it, yeah. <laughs> so it jumps ahead like three months into the future, and then they reveal the renovations that Dwight Manfredi has done to Bread to Buck Saloon to make it his like uh, supper club and casino. And I swear to God, guys, I don't know if you had the same thought I did, but what he does to the Bread to Buck Saloon is exactly what John Taffer does to every bar yes. he yes. rescues. Yes. He bar rescued <laughs> the saloon, and it comes in, everything's all sh- like sort of sleek and shitty and modern and comprehensively a ter- like a terrible in every way. Awful. Exactly yeah. like Taffer does. The Bread does. to Buck Saloon had some, had some character. It had a little bit of flavor. And this is that Applebeesification thing that Taffer does to every bar. Dwight Van Freddy was in prison for 25 years. And people were sending him kites describing axe throwing bars. <laughs> That's what he was doing instead of studying law. <laughs> it it is it is funny that, that that theory you had because like in well actually that it, it happens in wrestling, but it also happened in the Fast and the Furious movies where there were contracts 
that talked about basically the rock can't take too much damage in this match. Vin Diesel can't take too much damage in this fight. And like that, that it was like this big story and like in wrestling, the same thing happens is there's two companies, one guy and, and one of the companies get somebody from the other company. They beat the crap out of the guy and make him look like a fucking loser so that it kind of makes it worthless. So I could see Taylor Sheridan being like, look, I'll fucking knock motorcycle gangs right off the leaderboard at this point. <laughs> Absolutely. <They don't... laughs> but just, just the fact that like that Dwight's vision for like his ideal, like, like he's finally freed from New York. He can, Tulsa is his city now and he's planting his flag with a nightclub, a classy nightclub casino that looks exactly like what John Taffer would do to a bar where they used to drink, drink piss out of a shoe. And then he's like, the theme is uh, corporate. It's a, it's a business bar. And like, so there's a printer <laughs> uh, where, instead of a, a beer tap or whatever. So there's a fax machine. It's just... Uh, you should have brought Taffer in. Oh, Taffer like, is a guest it, star on Tulsa King? Oh, my God. Well, and they owe... They, it's on Paramount Plus, which is the company that owns... Uh, bar rescue. They should have brought Taffer in and had him put a Disarono machine in there <laughs> and f- fucking everything. It, it 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 barely looked different, but it looked like shit. The the <laughs> new version. Yes, it looked like what it looked like what a mafia guy would think a cowboy bar looks like. <laughs> well, it's like it's the same thing with Taffer. It's he's like he's just sort of like oh we need a, we need a theme here. And it's just like Tulsa. Okay, I'll put up. I'll put up framed like glossy photographs of the city of Tulsa in the bar, just to remind people that that's the theme we're going for is Tulsa, Oklahoma. I finally went to a John Taffer Bar Rescue restaurant, and it was pretty good. An right? incredibly horrible <laughs> experience <laughs> altogether. Just was like the service was terrible. Like in a way, like that that whoever was serving us was sitting at a table on their computer and they would walk over every like 15 minutes and be like, Hey, do you guys want something? And then the food tasted like shit. And it was just like, wow, he, he just, it's beautiful that it's kind of like a carny trick that he just goes in, moves some furniture around, and then the company can be successful for six months. <laughs> Fucking and, uh, uh, because they got a uh, TV. John Taylor, yes. is not, the entire thing that they give you for being on Bar Rescue is that now you're on television and, lo- and local people whose lives are completely barren of anything to do or any meaning are like, oh, let's go to that place as I saw on the TV show. John Taff- I think and that gets you like six months worth of uh, worth of income. John Taffer is I think like the world. That you could then bet like gamble with and maybe make your mortgage if you hit red. Yeah. John Taffer is like the World Bank or the IMF <laughs> <laughs> going into these developing countries. They do not recover from Taffer's Giving micro loans to horny alcoholics. <laughs> It's yeah, them with debt yeah. for the rest of their life. I need to like they bar owners across America. I know I've said there there are too many bars. Maybe merge uh, and start a non-aligned movement where you're not where you're neither <laughs> you're neither with uh, you're neither with John Taffer nor Gordon Ramsay. You're sort of starting. Yeah, we own. have a, we have a place that uh, it's really funny. We have a place that Gordon Ramsay like made over in town. And uh, it's in what used to be the old Wonder Bread factory. And like, so that would be. Isn't that a think, sign like, of what, uh, America today? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. The Wonder Bread jobs go away and some smug British asshole comes in and makes a, a gastro pub in what used to be something that provided a thousand jobs for a community. <laughs> yeah. It changed the name to City Tavern. It was that'll just like stand as out. generic. That'll, yeah. that'll really <laughs> stand out. I, if you saw the sign outside, it really looks like something they went to like Michael's craft store and bought. Like it's, it's one of the, the worst vibes. And I was just like, they could have called it like Wonderland or something like that. Really do the history thing. But instead they were like, what about city tavern? Yeah, just- um, the thing that didn't get a lot of play from John Taffer that really bums me out. I watched the first episode was the one where he would fix your marriage. Like it was a real oh, bummer I remember that, that people didn't gravitate to that the way they did bar rescue, because that is a way more psycho thing to have John <laughs> Taffer involved in <laughs> than fixing bar. If John Taffer, if John Taffer, fixed your marriage 
you were, I don't know, weeks away from killing your spouse. And that's probably what happened six months later, too. We well, Je- installed a two-touch PCO system on your wife's coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when we stood in, when me and Matt stood in that room and watched John Taffer, there is a truly fucking psycho energy to the oh guy. Oh, my like, God. You're just standing there, and it's like, this guy's fucking, yeah, he He's yelled. screaming at everyone. He's so for, mad at them for letting small business down. <laughs> for 15 minutes, it never slowed down. It is like 80s wrestling promos. He went up there, screamed for 15 minutes, and then walked off stage and was gone. And it was he, amazing. But, but before that, he made everyone m- m- take a vow to support small business. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was wild. And he spoke shorter than anybody. He was like the main event at this at this American for a Prosperity thing. And yeah. he was shorter than Bobby Jindal and Jeb, <laughs> who we also got to see. I, like, I'm fit, one of my favorite memories from that is we were sitting behind this person when, when Bobby Jindal came out. And the woman just she like leaned over to the person she's with and was like, that's Bobby Jindal. <laughs> like she was like super <laughs> excited. And it's always uh, stuck with me. Like Bobby Jindal is the guy. What the I had happened I, to Bobby Jindal. I, I, I had that Where's moment. I, I had that moment when covering the 2016 primaries, um, when, uh, I was at a, uh, God, wait, it was some, some loser. Okay. It was someone who was just, um, just floundering. I think it was um, uh, a Marco event in uh, yeah some some pub in New Hampshire that looked looked like it needed a Ramsey makeover. And Carly Fiorina was supposed to make a later appearance. And these two <laughs> mass holes, uh, two guys with like who looked like they would be sent to kill Dwight and Freddie. Actually, they were wearing floor length <laughs> leather jackets, and they just showed up screaming, "Where's Carly?" <laughs> we're here for Kali Fiorina. And it just gave, gave me an insight into like what what kind of a fucking dope you have to be to be really into like the Republican primary. Not even like the, not even like Ted Cruz or Donald Trump. Carly Fiorina. Like these two these two fucking mass holes, these two guys who are probably like the the only thing I could guess for their job is like failed loan shark. It, it, they're like, oh, the woman who like ran HP into the ground. That's who we like. I have this thing where um, basically every band that ever had a hit still has an audience. Like there's still people who will go see every like the blue dabu d guys that like, like there's there's or, or i listened to a podcast where the guy's a real big fan of aqua the the barbie girl <laughs> and he like fucking travels to go see aqua and i find that fascinating and in the political version of that is some republican that got one percent of the vote that somebody's really excited yeah. to see. <laughs> i mean it's when those people were excited about bloomberg I, I remember when, when like, in 2016, there was a period where we were just sitting on Twitter watching people fucking go nuts about Bloomberg being the president. And I wonder what they're doing now. They're probably working for the Lincoln Project. But I wonder <laughs> actually what they're doing. Uh, they're extorting vape shops in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Carly Fio. <Fiore. clears throat> All right, gentlemen, let's uh, wrap it up there for today. I would like to thank our, our one of our, our oldest podcasting friend, Brian Quimby. But uh, before we let you go, uh, we should let all listeners to this show know that you have recently had a change of address on uh, Patreon.com. It's Patreon.com slash Murder X Brian. It's all the stuff that I've been doing for a few years plus. You know, I just finished this week all of the Shocktober season one. We'll be up there. Like, I'm getting my archive up there sort of slowly. And uh, also, uh, you know, currently work the last episode scheduled to post on Friday. I just did a mini series about Dane Cook called Now We're Cooking, where we watched a few uh, Dane Cook things and then decided if they were cooking. And I'm going to spoil this for you. The only thing that was cooking was Mr. Brooks. That was the one thing that was good. The rest of the stuff was shit. And uh, I'm starting one called this. This is my TED talk where I have people where I'm going to review TED and TED two a half hour at a time with different <laughs> people. Um, 
because somebody brought up I I think like it's weird because he's kind of lost some some star quality, but like Seth MacFarlane is like a like I I recently would be going through HBO Max and see a million ways to die in the West on there. And I was just like, I can't believe people even saw that. And uh, so I want to do a Seth MacFarlane thing. I've never seen Ted and Ted 2. So uh, I'm pretty excited to try it. But also it's, you know, again, we've got like Shocktober. I have a series called I'm Sorry that uh, Will was on that people really love. It's where we make fun of public apologies, which is kind of mean, but (laughs) we pick people that are bad. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's, uh, yeah, I just do series. Yeah, yeah, plenty, plenty of murder Brian content. Uh, now, now under 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 all under one umbrella, and I'm commanding you, the listener, to like and subscribe on Patreon to the the new Brian Quimby Patreon. But Murder uh, X Brian, patreoncom slash Murder X Brian. Link will be in the show description. But uh, thanks once again, Brian, for coming on the show. Uh, that does it for us today.